And you're all so loud. I want to use my gavel. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Lake Bluff School District 65 Board of Education regular meeting for January 28th, 2020. Julie, could you please take the roll? Sure. Uh, Mark Berry. Present. Leanne Charlo. Yes. Julie Gottschall, present. Richard Haig. Present. John Morosin. Present. Andy Duran, absent. Ann Hill, absent. So we have enough for quorum, so we're going to begin. Uh, uh, would everybody please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. As we do every week, we offer the opportunity for public comment. If anybody would like to do so, please step forward and address the board. Not hearing any, we're gonna move on. Asking the board if they would like to offer up an uh, additional agenda item for a future meeting or a something that needs to be discussed tonight. A report uh, out, possibly. Richard may have a oh, report is that, out. Is that what we're gonna do yes. at this point? Richard, would you like Richard, to? would you like to give everyone an update on the meeting you attended? I was hoping I could do that. Yes, <laughs> why don't you? <laughs> um, you got a little cheat sheet in front of you. This was regarding the Stonebridge development, which uh, we had a meeting on a week ago, Saturday at 11 o'clock. It was uh, to be an informational meeting uh, attended primarily by uh, West Terrace neighbors, although there were other people in the community there, um, primarily because uh, those neighbors have the m uh, most interest in the project and are most concerned about the project. Um, <clears throat> these are, are from my notes that I took, so uh, there might be a little uh, question about some of the facts, but generally this is <laughs> my understanding of what, what's going on there. Um, originally they had the uh, planned residential development approved back in around 2005 to 2006, and at that time, it was uh, going to be three different types of housing, including single families, duplexes, and condominiums, a uh, total of about 85 units with uh, age restrictions so that some of the units could only be used by uh, people 55 years and over. And <clears throat> they had a couple of uh, the model homes up and one of the duplexes up when 2008 came, at which time everything imploded. And even though they had six or eight units that were under contract, none of the contracts were ever closed. Um, at that, then back around 19 or 2011, uh, the Roanoke Group, which is a group out of California, development group out of California, came in and bought it for eight plus million. And um, <clears throat> they thought that that was a, uh, a discounted price significantly because a lot of, some of the work had been started. Um, now they claim that the Roanoke Group claimed that they have 17 million sunk into the project um, as far as the improvements that had been done. Uh, the underlayment of the roads, the electrical, the water, and the sewer, they're all in place. Um, <clears throat> the plan for the Roanoke Group is significantly different in that it's all single-family homes. And uh, they were looking at putting 98 single-family homes in there of various sizes, somewhere, I think, between you know, 2,000 square feet and 4,500 square feet. And the numbers seem to jump all over the place when you talk to people on that. So I'm not sure. The price point they were looking at was they said they needed something between nine, 900,000 and a million one averaging to make the thing work, which would have been uh, a taxable, you know, about a, a hundred million dollars out there. So it's, it's significant. Um, <clears throat> the big uh, problem that that um, the Roanoke Group faces right now is when they bought the property, there was still a covenant in it that said 
the manor house and the gatehouse could not be demolished. It's previously, they were going to use the uh, manor house and the gatehouse, turn them into condos, and uh, the village is not, uh, even though Roanoke Group, as I understand, has tried to get that removed, the village hasn't acted on it. They've pushed it back for 30 days. Chances are pretty good they'll push it back another 30 days until they you know, come to some agreement on what they want to do. So that is the, uh, the unknown. Uh, many of the residents, of course, want to have the uh, nearby residents would like to have the original uh, plan, which they liked. It included the manor house, which um, even though it's, it's suffered somewhat over the years, uh, they did keep the heat on and they did have sump pumps running so that there wouldn't be any huge disasters. But uh, no one's really sure what kind of money it would take to put those back into uh, operation. Um, and they've never been able to find any other viable use for the uh, for the property or, or for the manor house uh, to this date. So Romana sketched out their timeline of thinking that uh, they were hoping to have all approvals and everything in place by the end of this year, and being the work working on the roads and the foundations in 2021 and then start selling uh, units in probably in 2022. And they estimated that it would take, they'd sell about 18 a year. And uh, so it'd be like about a six year build out before they completed the thing. Um, <clears throat> the, the big sticking points are, there's been a, a big problem with the 10 acres that are in front of the property on the Green Bay uh, side of the property because originally this was a Jens Jensen property. <coughs> Jens Jensen was a famous architect from Denmark who did a lot of work for Henry Ford and was a private archi uh, landscape architect living in um, Highland Park and so had done a lot of work on the North Shore. He has the attitude of what he called the long view where you have a, a large house, but you can't see it from the road. You, instead, you drive on a long or winding path, and you would only see little glimpses of the place until you got up in front of it, and boom, out it comes. So uh, people are upset with the way that, that, land, that those 10 acres have been taken <laughs> care of. There's a lot of, um, uh, what is it, buckthorn that's grown up. Uh, they've taken out a lot of trees, but said that they're concerned most with the canopy of the area. And there were some landscape architects there um, giving them, <laughs> stating their opinions. Um, the neighbors have been very upset about a fence that was built along the property because their homes face it and the fence hasn't been taken care of. So the developers had some <coughs> PR problems with the, with the rest of the community on this. Um, it seemed to be the interest of the uh, neighbors over on the West Terrace that they would like to see something that would revert back to the original plan. Uh, at any rate, they're, they're very concerned with what's going on there. Um, other than that, there's some concern that if uh, they were able to get, if Roanoke uh, developers were able to uh, get rid of the, or get the de demolition uh, permit that they might be in a position where they just flip the property to another developer, <laughs> which they could do. So there are a lot of questions. I think from our standpoint, you have to look at it, you know, at the very earliest, it would be an issue in about five or six years. But Richard, did they talk at all about um, the number of kids that they think could come from this now that there's more homes? I No, they did not. And I'd have to, I mean, my feeble math was, you know, one and a half kids per family and maybe two-thirds of the people having families and, and two-thirds of that was <laughs> or would be in our district right. or we'd be responsible for them. And, uh, you know, it came out maybe 70 kids or something. So you weigh that versus 
whatever our whatever we'd get out. And Jay, you'd probably know this: what we'd get out of a hundred million of uh, new tax of new tax property. Yes, because you have all those figures at your fingertips. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but just an estimate. I mean, I don't I don't know what percent of the tax dollar goes to the school district, and then from that, it's like six dollars per well. Two dot two fifty feet per hundred dollars is equivalent to assessed value. So, is I don't know if that's market yeah. value or assessed value. At any rate, there'd be some there'd be some trade off there as far mm -hmm. as the revenue we get. My only concern would be, which is something I think the district just needs to monitor, is that if all those kids came in at the elementary school, we don't we wouldn't have room for them. We would have to do some kind of building addition. So. <coughs> If that happened, and it would, you know, it, it's not going to, it doesn't look like it would explode all at once. Right. It would be That's a gradual right. increase, and, and you'd kind of have a, an idea of what was coming around the bend. So, and it, I mean. And it's four or five, at the minimum. At the minimum, out. four or five years out. You'll be long retired. Yeah. And, well, and you've got to keep in mind, four or five years out, we're heading towards the point that our bonds will be done exactly. as well. Exactly. So I think that that's an important piece. Yeah. So, and there is another meeting on this uh, demolition issue on Thursday, if anyone would like to attend. All right, any questions? Well, I was just noticing, I mean, you're talking about five or six years, but they're saying they would start selling units in, in 2022, so. Well, and I think that's. That's around the corner. It is. But 2022, you know, you sell the unit, it right. takes a year, year to build, you know. That assumes that they get the variances that they need to right, right. move ahead. No, I understand. There's a lot of what ifs. Yeah. <coughs> Very good comprehensive report. Thank you. So were there any, uh, anybody you, else? Julie, that's, <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy. Thank you for attending on a Saturday. Yeah, and the weather was bad too, if I remember correctly. So It was. <clears throat> any other questions for Rich or any other agenda items that anybody wanted to raise? And if you think of something later, you can always email myself or Jean. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to reports, and we're going to start with uh, Margaret St. Clair, our principal at the elementary school. Hi, everybody. Um, we thought we'd give an update on our STEAM program. Um, this past year, we hired a teacher to teach our K-2 music and then start implementing um, a STEAM program currently for grades 3, 4, and 5. So I wanted to give an update on what she's been working on um, and let you guys know how that's going. So she's working with our 3rd, 4th, and 5th grade students, and what she's doing, Vicki Weber, is meeting with classroom teachers to plan for a STEAM-based unit that is connected to a curricular unit that they're already doing in either or science so that it's connected to something that the students are already learning. So um, third grade worked with her first trimester and they aligned it with their science weather and climate unit. So she had them create something to assist a community impacted by a disaster that was caused by weather. So an example, one group designed a better drainage system for an area affected by tsunamis. So that's an example of one of the projects that the students did. In fourth grade, they're set to begin second trimester, which we're in right now. Um, they had already started a small Rube Goldberg type of experience for students after learning about simple machines. So she's expanding that in her work with the teachers, and they're going to have to create a machine with a purpose. So transport an object, knock something down, etc. And then she's adding a reflection piece to that so that students are kind of building their own rubrics and assessing how well their design works. And that all meets our ISD Illinois technology standards. Um, for fifth grade, they're just in the development stages, but they wanted to connect their STEAM unit to a social studies unit that they do on American history from post-American Revolution times. So they're gonna be learning about inventions that were um, developed during that time and based on the needs that they had, and then they're going to brainstorm needs of our current time and kind of create inventions in a similar fashion. So um, she's been hard at work, also teaching then our K2 music programs. So 
Um, that looks a little bit differently than it did in past years. We have separate music programs for kindergarten, first and second grade this year. And so um, in past years, we had kind of a combined program in the spring and then our winter sing-along. So she's done an excellent job just really coming in guns a-blazing. She's really well-trained and is working. She knows every student in our building at this point. Um, also, as a side note, she's just a published children's author recently, and so she has a book available on Amazon. So um, she's multi-talented. So I did just want to give you an update on that. Um, any questions that you all might have? Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Now we're going to hear from Mr. Nate Blackman. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to provide an update on the SBR work that's been going on. Uh, you may recall uh, the last time I presented on that, I recommended that we'd be adopting a hybrid model, which includes a letter grade uh, for each of the academic classes next year. Uh, the Standards-Based Reporting Committee has been hard at work uh, to implement changes that we think and hope will address the needs of our students, parents, as well as teachers. Um, some of the priorities that we're working to address include the following, and I'll, and I'll start by uh, highlighting some of those parent priorities. Um, one would be a clear and concise uh, summary of how students are doing in each of their classes. Um, looking for a tool that communicates uh, when it's time to worry or take comfort in how the students are progressing. Um, also a tool that communicates clearly um, information about work completion and assessment information. And at this point, I think it'd be appropriate to talk a little bit about homework because I think that's been a recurring topic of conversation. Um, currently homework is evaluated. Currently, your homework is tracked and reported out in the form of uh, learner characteristics. Uh, we would continue to do that. The goal would be to be able to make it very clear and incorporate uh, homework into a uh, platform where parents can see um, exactly what's been turned in on time, late, missing, and uh, there's been a lot of clicking we know in order to get to that information. So that's something that we're certainly focusing on uh, meeting the needs of. But I do want to be clear, uh, homework is uh, reported and counts and is expected to be completed. Um, a system that fosters a smooth transition to high school. That's also been feedback that we've received from parents. A system that motivates students to achieve at a high level. Um, from the teacher perspective, we want to make sure to preserve and cultivate a growth mindset among our students, uh, provide students with accurate and meaningful feedback, um, enable us to collect both summative and formative assessment data. Um, that formative data uh, can be used then to adjust our approach, make sure that we're uh, meeting the kids' needs and uh, appropriately challenging them. Um, uh, we also need a system that respects the nuances between subject areas and content. Uh, certainly, different classes have different needs for the reporting tool, and we need something flexible enough to meet all of those needs. Um, provide students with an understanding of their progress and motivate them to work hard just kind of an overview of some of those things that we're trying to address. Um, as we move ahead, and we were, um, I am very encouraged and confident that we'll be able to address these needs and these priorities. Uh, we're currently evaluating different ways to calculate grades based on content and curricular standards taught at each grade level. Uh, we're also reviewing, reviewing our current reporting software um, and investigating others that may perhaps even uh, meet those needs better. So um, all of which is happening as we speak. We have our next SBR meeting coming up next week. Any questions for me? And Nate will be coming in May to report out what next year is going to look like and give us more of a more of a what the committee's worked on and the final product. Have you guys uh, considered or actually spoken to other districts who are going through similar? things because I know there are other districts that have moved toward a hybrid model and they're maybe learning. Yeah, we absolutely have and in fact looked at some of the different ways in which those districts are calculating, uh, even the software tools that they're using. Um, feedback has been very helpful. I would say we're walking the walk right along with a lot of those other districts in terms of uh, adjustments that we're trying to make and areas that we want to improve upon. Um, but, but certainly uh, there are also other districts that have utilized uh, Otis as their platform uh, for communicating both in a hybrid model or in a standards-based model. Um, we're going back and taking another look at PowerSchool, which is our school information system, but for many years was also our reporting tool. Um, they are continuing to try and incorporate some new features there, so we're going to be curious to see if that uh, could perhaps 
meet our needs. Um, but to answer your question mark, yes, we absolutely are communicating with other districts. Sounds good. Thanks, Nate. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So Thank now you. we're going to move on to our PTO report. No. Carrie's not here, so, but Aaron's here. So we'll skip to the Alliance Foundation report. Hi, good evening. Um, thanks. I'm, I know it's been a, quite a while since I've, I've uh, been here. Uh, it's really been like a, a autumn of transition for the Alliance. So I took over as president. Um, the folks who ran our uh, autumn fall fundraiser uh, letter writing campaign, they both moved out of, the t out of the area. And then we lost our treasurer in November due to some personal issues. So um, really, it's been kind of me getting up to speed. Um, the letter writing campaign was a little bit delayed due to that. Um, so I think we didn't get our letters out till December, where we usually get them out in, in October, which, which in turn kind of delayed our, our fall grants. So we're getting up to speed. One of the big things that I want to do in the, uh, in the spring is really kind of formalize and formalize our processes and kind of get them written down so that as we have uh, members come and go, um, we don't kind of run into some of these delays that we did this year. So um, as far as the fall letter writing campaign, as I mentioned, um, we got letters out in early December. I think because of that, we're probably seeing a little bit less um, in terms of donations uh, than, than we did in years past. So I think that we'll probably reach out uh, again in the spring. And I think we're gonna probably try a little different uh, technique than, than, than the letter writing campaign. I did a kind of an informal poll of folks and an awful lot of people don't recall seeing the letter in the mail and we realized like our, our logo isn't maybe necessarily that uh, um, clear. I, I think like a lot of folks kind of confuse it for, for junk mail and so I think it, it gets lost. So, um, so we'll be kind of working on that. As far as the um, fall grants, we had uh, eight total submissions, six from the elementary and two from the middle school. Uh, we had preliminary discussions about it. We, as we're working through our treasurer, we're kind of just trying to clear up where, where we're at uh, financially. Um, but, I, but I do believe that, and we're going to take a vote next week, but I do believe we should be able to fund um, all eight of the grants. Uh, one thing that I want to do over the next few weeks too, because some things have popped up in my email, is I just like to set up some time with Jay and kind of go through line by line all of the grants that have been um, awarded and just kind of see what's gone through and what hasn't, just to make sure that we're we're, we're clear on that. Um, and other than that, I just kind of leave on a, on a real positive note. This last weekend we had our winter warm up. Uh, so last, this is our second annual winter warm up. Last year it was kind of more of an awareness event just to make people aware, hey, we're the, the Alliance, this is what we do. This year we kind of took a little bit of a turn and, and, and made it a fundraiser. Uh, we had 92 people show up. We held it at the Deer Path Inn. It was really just a phenomenal event. Uh, Jude Sharp is our events coordinator, just did a fantastic job coordinating. Uh, we had a silent auction, the, the, all the businesses, local businesses. Uh, chipped in. We had everything from, you know, uh, Sunday brunches to signed Bears footballs, and we brought in a little bit over $5,500 to go towards grants. So we're really, really pleased with that. And that is it. Any questions? Thank you for all Thanks. your work. I know yeah, it's been a uh, <laughs> very busy transition period. It has, it has, but it's been good. So everybody's, I mean, you know, it's a, just a great group of people, and People have been over backwards to kind of help speed that transition along. So great, thanks great. to your group. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Wow. <coughs> he does have a short. Next, Jay has next. a short update just to bring you up to speed in a couple sentences on the food service program because you're going to hear more about it next month. So Quest um, Food Service did a survey of students and parents before winter break, and they are taking the feedback that they got uh, very seriously. They um, have a very good reputation, and they didn't feel like the, the, the experience in the first six months of our program was up to their standards. <coughs> uh, they've made some management changes. They hired an additional level of management and uh, to oversee their program, and they worked out an action plan to address some of the issues that appeared in the surveys. Uh, they're focusing on food quality and temperature, line speed, and trying to increase participation through um, better food more and different food options as well as in improved merchandising. 
and they will be here next meeting at the February Council. February 11th. To, um, just give you an update on their their experience to date and their action plan going forward and some financial results. I think the other thing is we brought them to the PTO meeting and the PTO was very generous in giving lots of feedback on reasons why they buy, why they don't buy, what would make it easier for them. And I think they got some really good feedback. Yeah. So um, this new group seems very, very willing and wanting to hear feedback to improve things. And that's encouraging. So, all right. Thank you, Jay. Questions for Jay? Anybody? Um, a president's report. I'm going to do this with Gene. Just in case anybody in the community is not aware, we have a, a, a retirement coming up, several, and, and a new superintendent starting on July 1st, Dr. Lisa Leali from currently in Kenilworth. She's winding down there and has been working very closely with Dr. Sophie about establishing a series of meetings to help in her transition as she onboards into Lake Bluff. Uh, I will be meeting with her next week to have a sit down and talk a little bit about some board development training and just give her some background on a lot of different things that are going on in our community. But it's a very involved process. She's very committed to uh, transitioning out of Kenilworth um, effectively and doing her best job there to make it easy for whoever their next superintendent is. But um, just wanted to make everybody know that, make sure everybody knows that she's definitely involved with Dr. Sophie and I think Dr. Sophie can elaborate a little bit more on some of the things they've got coming up this year. Uh, Lisa and I have already met twice. Um, Lisa is not winding down yet because they haven't named their new superintendent. Um, so they are expecting to name their new superintendent in the next two weeks. And I told her it will get a little bit easier then. Um, very anxious to come in and start to meet people. But on the other end, she is also very conscientious and wants to do a good job on her contract there. So um, we have some things. She will be at our kindergarten orientation tomorrow night, greeting families as they come in. Um, she will, she's making a visit um, to both the elementary school and the middle school and spending a half a day in the same week in March. Um, she's having breakfast with me and with our union president. We've got her coming to greet parents at a couple of different concerts at both schools. Um, and that's just the beginning. So we have a really nice start. You have a board workshop scheduled with her. And it helps a lot because I can meet her very early in the morning because we live right by each other. So good. it's been good. She's very excited to get started. So Great. Um, presentations, board goal two, the five essentials data. I think. So Nate and Margaret, I'm going to have you come up to the stand. I'll do it from here, and then Shelley, I'll just we'll tell you when to flip the slide for us. This presentation is a few months late in being presented to you because, as you know, this fall we were very busy with some other issues and with the superintendent search. So um, this is a result of our five essential survey from last year. Um, to give you a timeline, we have already literally just started administering the Illinois Five Essentials for 2020. Um, this was first administered in the spring of 2013 to teaching staff and students in grades 6 through 8 throughout the state. It's been expanded now to students in grades 4 through 8 for the past three years. It is required under state law as a survey of learning conditions. The results are actually built into our ESSA funding that Kevin has talked to you about. The five essentials that they measure are effective leaders, collaborative teachers, ambitious instruction, supportive environment, and involved families. And each one is um, measuring different perceptions. So some of them are measured by teachers, some are measured by parents, and some are measured by students. So as we go through these with you very quickly, you will hear which one is measuring what. The scoring is down at the bottom. There's least implementation, less implementation, average, more, and then most. And I will say our results are always in the highest group. We're well organized for improvement. Our general data is that our classes are challenging and engaging. Our principals and teachers have a shared vision for success. Our teachers collaborate to promote their professional growth. 
The entire staff builds strong external relationships with our families, our community, um, et cetera, our, and our schools are safe, demanding, and supportive. Um, so overall, we're well organized for that. I get to take the first one on effective leaders. Our 2018 score was 50, and our 2019 score was 48, what's all in. What's the scale? I don't have the scale. So I haven't 48 done that. out of 48 or 48 out of? 48? It's 40 out of 100. Okay. Um, very, very few districts even get into the 80s and 90s for, for just for a comparison. 48 and 50 are in the same band. Um, the strengths that we have are teacher principal trust, teacher influence, and our areas for growth are program coherence. A lot of that falls from um, kind of what Mark and John heard last year. We have many initiatives going on with the teachers and sometimes they feel like it's just too much on their plates to try to balance everything. And then our instructional leadership, which kind of falls in the same band. So is there a target here of some sort? Target's or? always 100. And what do you need to get to 100? What do we need to do differently to get to 100? We need to keep working on, for instance, I think one of the areas for growth, and Margaret and Nate are going to be talking about the, what they're actually doing in their buildings based on this data. Okay. But I would share with you that, obviously, when they're concerned about all the initiatives they have, we have to cut back on initiatives and make sure we focus in particular areas. I mean, if your kid came home with a score of 50 on the test, it's, it wouldn't be good. It wouldn't be good. That's what right. I was asking. The but the way you've got to remember that this is a state, ta a state assessment, that should be enough said. But when you want to expand on that, it's um, this is average implementation. Most of ours are in the higher range. So. I'm going to turn it over, Margaret. You have I have collaborative, collaborative teachers. teachers. So this one fell in the more implementation range, which is better than average. Um, our score in 2018, 64, 2019, 60. Um, strengths were school commitment, teacher, teacher trust, quality professional development. Um, also pointing out that quality professional development was an area for growth the year before, but it's an area of strength for. Um, this set of data. Areas for growth are collaborative practices and um, collective responsibility, though that was a strength at um, LBES. So the collective re or the collaborative practices refers to teachers um, responding to questions such as I am in my peers classroom to observe them teaching and to give them feedback and things like that. Um, that is something that we've had to scale back on a little bit because of our sub shortage. So um, teachers are working together to plan. They're, we need to continue to build ways for them to get into each other's classrooms during um, the teaching day. Just a clarification. This, the, the, the label for the more, more mm -hmm. implementation, the previous one was average implementation. So more is, is that better. Based on the score? So yes. If you yes. fall in the 64 to 60 right. range, you get more below right. that is average. Okay. Yes. So and then you'll see that both we, in the same band. I think that's a key part. Correct. Too. And then you'll also see we are we have something coming up that's in the most, which is the best band. <laughs> it's very confusing. Um, this one is regarding involved families. This is response also from teachers. Our score very close in 2018 and 19, um, so that's also in that more implementation band, which is above average. Strengths being parent involvement in the school and overall parent influence on decision making. Areas for growth being teacher parent trust. That would be from teacher perception of trust and support from parents is um, something that just is requiring a little bit more time than maybe it once did. All right, uh, supportive environment. We're very consistent in this area. 
um, maintaining the most implementation category for both years. Uh, strengths in that case were academic professionalism, peer support for academic work and safety, um, an opportunity for growth, uh, student teacher trust. Uh, student teacher trust, that's, that's devised, derived from a student perspective on climate and culture, uh, but again, it's just, we're, we're being a little nitpicky there simply because it was the lower of the other components that feed into this. We're still in the most implementation uh, category. The next section is ambitious instruction, and that's more implementation is the identifier there. Uh, we've gone from 81 in 2018 to 77 in 2019. Strengths being uh, English instruction, math instruction, academic pressure. Um, we'll talk a little bit more in the recommendation section, but um, the area that was lower than the other components to this one was uh, quality student discussion, uh, which includes um, building on others' ideas. This is, again, student... Uh, this is all student perception. Student perception. Building on others' ideas, providing constructive feedback to their peers, use of data and text reference to support their ideas. How many, how many people responded to this? So... Just a little under 100% of our students responded because um, we build that into our they have to take instructional it. practices and create time for it. Um, and same is true with our uh, staff. I don't have the percentage of parents that completed off the top of my head, um, but it's considerably lower. Considerably right. less. It's, it's quite a bit less. We build in time for our teachers to take the survey as well at staff meeting time. So it's usually a pretty high percentage of teachers. There's been one year that we didn't even have enough parent feedback to even give us a rating in that. It's usually very low. And we send out a lot of reminders on it, so. Okay, so um, in the what's next, Nate and Margaret are gonna talk. Obviously, we got this data in the late summer, and so they were able to bring this to their teams, and their teams take a look at this data, and then based upon this data, they make goals. So each of them is going to share a couple of their goals in their buildings based on this data. So some of this work has been occurring district-wide. Some of it is more building-specific. Uh, the first is a district-wide component that was built into our professional development planning process. Um, the admin team, along with the uh, Teachers' Council, formalized a plan for engaging our building leadership teams in developing and planning for one of our faculty meetings that occurs every month. We have two every month. Um, the idea there being to um, turn Target specific topics that are timely and relevant to the teachers and making sure to engage them in the uh, agenda creation for those faculty meetings that occur uh, and that's again for one of the two meetings. Another component for professional development is giving teachers some choice or options, so kind of differentiating for their professional development. So one example is they were working on differentiation for learners, and their teams could pick would they like to work with our math specialist, a reading specialist, a writing specialist to define what um, their students needed the most. Um, another area at Lake Bluff Elementary is ways to facilitate those student conversations that was pointed out. And so um, our teachers have their continued professional development with our um, teachers college representatives that come out to our schools. And part of that is working to help facilitate student-led learning where they're having conversations with each other about their work that isn't quite as teacher directed. Um, I would say another component we can both speak to um, separately, but kind of a district goal is through our foundation safe and civil schools work that we've been embarking for the last four years. That's to create um, school environments that feel safe and positive and structured. And so our LBES PEP committee has focused specifically on having teachers create relationships with students that they may not necessarily have in class. So maybe pick a student that they see comes in in the mornings and doesn't come in with an, a peer and smiling and laughing. They kind of, in their minds, are trying to make those connections with students that are outside of their classroom so that our students feel like they have an adult in the building aside from their classroom teacher that they have a relationship with. 
Very specifically looking at that student discussion piece, uh, one of the things that we've worked to implement uh, are the Socratic Circle discussion techniques. Um, if you're not familiar with a Socratic Circle, um, you would imagine uh, walking into a classroom and seeing actually two circles, one in the middle of the class and then another on the outside of the class. And uh, those students assigned to those specific circles would, uh, would change depending upon uh, where they are in the lesson. But essentially, the group in the middle is going to be the ones speaking and contributing and bouncing ideas off from one another and building upon each other's ideas. It's really hard for the students sometimes, but those in the outer circle are, are not to talk. And they have a document that they're working on and they're collecting data and actually um, evaluating the class discussion occurring in the inner circle. Um, toward the end of the activity, that outer circle gets their opportunity to elaborate on the discussion that was occurring in the inner circle, um, there's a lot of uh, language used, such as um, I re a respectful disagreement that might be, I respectfully disagree, the students will say. And sometimes you'll see that incorporated in class discussions, even when we're not doing Socratic circles, and I, and I love it. Um, and they do have the opportunity to switch roles, but it really does formulate a lot of those areas that were identified on our uh, five essentials as needing some improvement. And uh, so I'm excited to see how the results for that one uh, may change, hopefully, this year. So I uh, wanted to mention that. Also, um, one of the things that is ongoing in our building, and this is building-wide, is the advisory committee that's been meeting since 2019, um, early 2019. Uh, we've made some changes to the advisory program. We've done a lot of research and, and uh, connected with other schools. Um, and the uh, response that we have gotten when we ask about other schools and their advisory program is, we want to work on ours and we'd love to hear what your recommendations are and how it's going for you. We get a lot of that uh, because when we get it, dialed right in, we'd like to take that show on the road and talk about it. There are a lot of middle schools looking for uh, advisory programs that are really working well for everybody. One of the elements that we did bring in, ELO, if that's a term your kids are coming home and, and, and talking about, that stands for extended learning opportunities. Um, we've capitalized on some of that advisory time to allow students the opportunity to either seek uh, support from a teacher, so they can sign up to go and see one of their teachers, even if they aren't their advisor. Um, it also is an opportunity for a teacher to go ahead and recruit students that they need to see, either for enrichment purposes or because they need some additional support. Um, there is a very elaborate Google Doc created, and uh, daily it allows us to communicate with our uh, teams and our, and our advisors to recruit and send kids to the different parts of the building. But each day is identified for different subject areas. So every uh, academic teacher has a day of the week, as well as our fine arts teachers have a day of the week that they can engage with kids, uh, both in an enrichment capacity as well as an academic support capacity. Feedback from kids and from parents has been pretty strong on that. Um, so that's something that we hope will uh, contribute to um, some positive results on the Five Essential Survey as well. I think the other thing that I would share is we went through um, the, can you switch that back for me, Shelly? I'm not, thank you. Um, uh, something else that I wanted to share though as we were looking at data is that we literally had just finished bargaining when the teachers took this last year and the new contract had not been implemented. One of the things that's most important to them with their professional development is that they have, um, that they're able to work and kind of make their own choices for one of the staff faculty meetings. And so now that that's actually in their contract and they're able to do that, I think that is gonna take care of some of their issues of professional development and really trying to balance all the initiatives that are on their plate. So that's important to note. Um, I do wanna share with you that we will, we're always going to be administering the survey we have since it started and that this is the first year, after this school year, all students will then have taken the survey for three years, meaning fourth through sixth, and so we'll have more broken out data by students after this year as well. So any questions? Can we go back to the first slide, the first well, statistic? The On leadership? leadership? The, mm -hmm. the one with the really strikingly, surprisingly mm -hmm. bad numbers. Um, We're I, usually what, right in there for average. Okay. Mm -hmm. hmm. Now, who answers the questions that lead to these scores? Is it teachers? Just teachers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Very, very common in school districts under this one, only because of the fact that there, there's always a little bit of a challenge as administrators. We have 
a lot of things that we're trying to get through for program for professional development and teachers are overwhelmed we've talked a lot about that I think John and Mark heard a lot about that at bargaining last year mm -hmm. we heard a lot of it about it and I think what you're seeing and you will continue to see is that our teachers they they just can't have one more initiative we've got between the social emotional and keeping up with each of the curricular areas mm -hmm. and all the student needs um, which have multiplied greatly in the past couple of years they're on overwhelming and when you look on here the instructional leadership and the program coherence when you look into the questions it's all about hey guys we we have too much on our plate. Mm -hmm. We're having a hard time balancing all of this. Mm -hmm. I think what's confusing is the scales I said earlier on. I mean, 50% shouldn't, normally you wouldn't consider it to be average. This isn't 50, well, it, it, it does say 50%, it is. It is. Yeah, 100, well, that's normally not an average score. Unless you're playing baseball, batting 500 is a pretty good score. Well, there are two so. categories below average, yeah. which We're is. We're right in the middle. That, that yeah. makes sense to me, but I guess do we have any, uh, information from comparable school districts this is typical it's just in the nature of the mandates that are coming down from the state and the teacher frustration or is this unique to our district? it's very typical and that's something we can even follow up with you on a little bit I can have Kevin work on that yeah Kevin would probably know it off the top of his hat he's usually the one that presents this mm -hmm. I don't know it off the top of my head we've talked about it as an administrative team and I know that we're actually we're right in the middle with everybody else with this it's a tough one. I mean, and I look at it very seriously because I would obviously like it to be higher. Right. But I also realize where it's coming from and you're going to continue to see it because teachers are frustrated with all the things that are going on. So right. similar to Julie's question, I would be curious to see if there are districts that are getting what is the highest one most implementation. If there are districts that are operating in that zone, what are they doing? What are they doing? Right? I would, what can we learn from them? I would also question, though, how high their scores are. Because sometimes it's hard to be in that highest rung and still getting things done. Well, so there this, really is, has to be a correlation with both of those things. If, as long as you understand the data you're looking at, there still right. might be something to learn from a district that has Absolutely. So yeah, if we could hear from Kevin on mm -hmm. this point and just understand where we stand and what can be done, if anything. Maybe there's Agreed. nothing that can be done. Can we see the next one, too? Because that one wasn't too great. This one is like the B. If you assign these all letter grades, I hate to do that, Nate, turn over. <laughs> but if we assign them letter grades, this is like a B. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where the band lies for this one. It's not a 90, 80, 70, 60. I think that's what you were asking. Right. It's not a 90, 80, 70, 60. Right. You know, it also, the trend was a little bit downwards. Again, maybe not statistically significant, but certainly on these first two, who, who answers the questions? Is this all teacher reporting? Teachers. Today? Teachers. Okay. And again, they answered this right after bargaining last year. And right. a bargaining year is always going to be like that. Right. And you've talked to us a lot about the, the feeling that they don't have enough collaboration time and everything. So maybe it just, it just is what it is, and it's a frustration of our modern school day. But um, yeah, if we could hear just a little bit more Absolutely. from Kevin. Absolutely. I will have Kevin do that. Okay. Good. Interesting. Any other questions? Thank, Thank you. you. So if there's That's nothing it. else, we're going to move on to action items. Mm -hmm. We're going to start with uh, the 2020 typo, 20, <laughs> 2020, 21 uh, student fees. As, and as we discussed at our four, January 14th Committee of the Whole meeting, the board is asked to approve these student fees. I was hoping that either Jean or Jay or both could give us a very brief overview of Sure, just uh, to recap what we discussed at the last meeting. The administration is recommending that we increase the regular registration fee five dollars from 205 to 210 in line with increasing costs we use the methodology of adding up all the supply instructional software and technology costs and allocating 60 percent of that to fees um, we want to maintain our pre-k fee at forty one hundred dollars in line with comparables maintain our transportation fee as it was last year at two hundred dollars per student three hundred twenty five dollars per family and then keep all other fees the same. In addition, as part of registration, we want to have students purchase padlocks as a pass-through pass cost of $6 per lock. Um, and this is a, as a way to transition away from using the locks that are installed in the lockers 
uh, which will reduce the complexity of having to maintain all those locker combinations and reduce um, our custodial summer labor required to change those combinations over every summer. Um, and when we spoke about this last week, I had indicated that we weren't sure how it would look yet um, if we could do it. And since that time, we've determined that it's very easy to leave the lock face on the locker and just disable it, make, take the works off the back. Um, so the appearance will be fine. And it should actually be little to no cost because we would have the custodians changing the locker combinations anyway this summer. So instead of changing the combination, they'll just remove the lock and then going forward, we'll be saving on the labor and um, using the padlocks instead. Good. Any questions for Jay? No. May I have a motion to approve the 2021 student fees as presented by the administration? So moved. Second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? John Rosen. Yes. Leanne Charlo. Yes. Julie Gottschall. Yes. Richard Hag. Yes. Mark Ferry. Yes. Motion is approved. Similarly, the next item is for the 2021 uh, building use fees, as we discussed also at the January 14th Committee of the Whole. Uh, I was wondering if Mr. Khan could give us an overview of that as well. Uh, sure. These fees, uh, just as a preface, we don't really um, receive a lot of revenue in fees for, from using our buildings. Uh, the philosophy that the board has is to make them um, available to the community. So we're recommending leaving our fees the same. Uh, what we would do is not charge a fee for, we have basically four groups, um, school district affiliated groups, community groups, youth organizations that serve our students, and nonprofit organizations um, serving the local community would not pay a rental, a rental fee. The only fee would be um, maintained at $75 per hour for for-profit for groups that do not meet the other criteria. Um, for groups that incur, all, for all groups except for school district affiliated groups, we would pass along any increased custodial costs that we might incur uh, by re if we are required to have a custodian on the premises, uh, either for um, supervision or cleanup and um, of the events, and that would be passed through at cost of overtime at forty dollars per hour. And these are all, this is the in line with what we did last year. Any further questions? May I have a motion to approve the 2020-2021 building use fees as presented by the administration? So moved. Second. Roll call vote, please. Leanne Charlo. Yes. Julie Gottschall, yes. Richard Hag. Yes. Mark Berry. Yes. John Rose. Yes. Motion is approved. Item C under actions has to do with the new personnel report. Uh, for non-licensed new hires, we have Brooke Rolick, a library media specialist, replacing Nancy Goldberg at the middle school effective January 15th of 2020 at $15 an hour. Um, we also have Nicole B-I-E-L-A-K. B-Lack. B -E B-Lack, <laughs> teaching assistant, uh, replacing Susan Van Bonig at the elementary school, effective January 22nd, 2020 at $15 an hour. We have one FMLA request for Mallory Jorgensen, the media who's uh, in the media position, uh, requesting a. Uh, Leave of absence at the middle school for the remainder of the 1920 school year. And, and I want to clarify Mallory's is not an FMLA. Mallory's is, she's done her FMLA, so she's requesting a leave through the end of the year. She had twins, okay. so she now has three children under the eight, two and under. So she has <laughs> requested a leave through the end of the school year. <laughs> and luck. she said she'd like everyone to know she'd rather come back to work <laughs> right. if she's got to be home. Wow. So. Good luck. Good luck. All right. So uh, we have a motion to approve the January 28th, 2020 personnel report as presented by the administration. So moved. Second. Roll call vote, please. Julie Gottschall, yes. Richard Haig, yes. Mark Berry, yes. John Rosen, yes. Leanne Charles, yes. I, I know, motion mm -hmm. is approved. Uh, the next item has, is the consent agenda for the month. And in this month's consent agenda, we have the open session meeting minutes for December 19th, 2019, regular Board of Education meeting, the December 19th, 2019 truth and taxation hearing the January 14th, 2019 Committee of the Whole Meeting. We also have the Treasurer's Report, the Impressed Report, the Bills Report, and the PCAR Report. Would anybody like any of that pulled to discuss separately from the consent agenda? No. No. So, may I have a motion to approve the January 28th, 2020 consent agenda as presented by the administration? So moved. Second. Roll call vote, please. Richard Hag? Yes. Mark Berry? Yes. John Rosen? Yes. Leanne Charlo? Yes. Julie Gottschall, yes. The motion is approved. 
Uh, item 12, FOIA requests. We did have two FOIA requests this year. This month, the details are presented in your board packet. Uh, are there any board com uh, uh, public comments to be offered up for, for the board uh, as we conclude? Not seeing any. Does the board have anything they want to bring to? I just thought I'd let everybody know that uh, I know you all know Emily McVeigh. She fell and broke her kneecap last week, and she oh. could be out for quite some time. Her, her leg has to be in a straight position. Oh, I think she's teaching. Weeks. Yeah. No. Oh, she slipped in front of the Lake Forest bookstore. Oh. Emily? Emily McVeigh. I'm glad she you said something. Be, uh, I got to get a card there. She was the Alliance president. Alliance president, president yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And she was on our architectural committee. Yes, she college. was. She did a fine job, too. That's no, sad. that's too bad. Mm. Yeah, that is. Ouch. All right. So at 7.55, <laughs> may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>